there was no church of my denomination in Westchester where I was going to college. I decided to take the opportunity to explore how various people worshiped. I didn't know any other students who were doing this, but to me, leaving my hometown was about exploring. And what could be more basic to exploration than approaches to the meaning of life? At first, I chose where to go almost at random. Over time, I began to see that ch different churches had different strengths. I finally arrived at a friend's meeting. The town had an old Quaker tradition. The sign at the edge of town said, Westchester welcomes thee. Quaker's formal name was Religious Society of Friends, and in Westchester, they were so quiet that for a long time, they remained below my radar. I walked in not knowing what to expect. There were many people on plain benches, no pews. There was no altar or cross to focus the room. Instead, in front, there were a few risers with some people sitting on benches facing the rest of us like a choir, but silent. No one was standing or seeming to preside. Quiet rain. I slipped into an empty place and realized that the quiet didn't quite rain. It pervaded. As the minutes went by, noted by the ticking of an old wooden clock mounted on the wall, I shifted the metaphor again. Now, it seemed like the quiet was simply there, waiting to be joined. I tried joining. An older woman on the facing bench got up and told us about a spiritual experience she had had a few days before. I looked around, but saw no sign that this had stimulated anyone to follow up, to make a comment on what she said, or to give thanks. Instead, the quiet continued. Just as I started to wonder if I liked this strangeness, someone too rose for me, rose and prayed. He was an older man, somewhat frail, and spoke with an undercurrent of emotion. Suddenly, I was a boy again at my home church, attending Wednesday night prayer meeting with my grandfather. We'd entered what the pastor called a season of prayer. My grandfather, this strongly built slate worker, was on his knees, along with the other men in the room, who were keeping an expectant silence and then testifying or praying out loud or singing with tearful eyes. I loved the spontaneity, the pauses, the way that the very limbs of these men conveyed their earnest reverence. Those juicy Wednesday nights had dried up when I was, what, 14, 15? Prayer meeting had become simply a mini Sunday morning service held on Wednesday nights. Supportive, perhaps, but with the numinous gone missing. I stopped going, pleading homework as an excuse to my grandfather. Now, a young man rose from the front row across the room from me, wearing a plaid flannel shirt, no tie, no jacket. He talked of conflict inside himself, the challenge of his privilege when he came back from doing a weekend of volunteer work in a Philadelphia slum. He sounded real, perplexed, wanting help, yet no one rose to give him advice. The stillness got stronger as though it had a texture, something that could support weight. An outstretched hand appeared in front of my chest. Surprised, I turned to find the owner of the hand smiling and realized that all around me, people were shaking hands. I raised my hand to meet his and met his eyes again, which this time were twinkling. Welcome, he said. On my way out, I paused to look at the bulletin board on which notices were posted. A Quaker committee of some kind was urging people to write to Congress protesting the military draft. It suddenly hit me. I'd heard somewhere the Quakers were pacifists. I continued out the door, shaking my head from side to side as I descended the broad front steps. Well, I thought tolerantly, even the best people must be forgiven their eccentricities. I guess I'll go back and worship with them again.
in September 1956, I noticed in the college registration line a chance to indicate religious preference. Remembering positively my occasional drop-ins at Quaker meeting, I wrote Quakers to see what would happen. I soon received in the mail a postcard from one Cynthia Arbio saying she was having a coffee at her house on, for Quaker students. I showed up curious about her and what actual Quaker students might look like. Turned out that only one other student showed and neither of us was a Quaker. We both were motivated by curiosity. He, a black student, was curious because he had heard about the role Quakers had played in the Underground Railroad, including in the vicinity of Westchester. We had a delightful conversation in a room with one wall entirely filled with books, relaxing on easy chairs that I learned were rescued from used furniture stores. The Arby's three little girls wandered in to check us out. Cynthia told us that at college, she had majored in writing. Caring for her family didn't give her much time, but she liked to use some of it to write poetry. Her husband, Ray, was away a lot because he worked for a Quaker agency that had him traveling among colleges to stimulate student discussions about peace and justice. When my fellow student said he needed to leave, I asked if I could stay a bit to examine their library. Cynthia disappeared to put her children to bed, and I found myself entranced by the collection of edgy authors and titles on the shelves in no particular order. My job at the college is in the library, I said when she returned. Would you like me to put your books in some kind of order? <laughs> her laugh was hearty, and I enjoyed the light in her eyes. I hoped very much she'd say yes. I'd have to check with Ray about whether he wants them ordered, she smiled. I want him to meet you anyway. He'll be back Friday. How about then? Cynthia and Ray became long-lasting mentors, comrades, and intimate friends. I soon began organizing other students to walk over to their house for evenings of discussion about racial equality, pacifism, economic justice, and the tension between the individual and the collective. That was the second bit <laughs> that I'm reading today. Here's the third. As 1963 arrived, I realized that I would be turning 26 in November, which was the cutoff point for eligibility for the military draft. I was studying sociology at the University of Pennsylvania. All I had to do was stay in graduate school until November, no problem, since I had years to, still to go to get my PhD. And the government would then set me free of my obligation. The trouble was that cruising along and making my A's at an Ivy League university is not what a working class person would call doing my part. As a working class boy, I knew that each of us needs to do our part. It certainly wasn't doing my part in comparison with high school classmates being sent to Vietnam. That fracture in solidarity was more than I wanted to live with. So I told my draft board that I was volunteering to be drafted. The draft board sent me the draft order. In those days, some draft boards were open to a conscientious objector's own proposal for the two years of alternative service. Mine my draft board agreed to my proposal of going to Friends Peace Committee, an agency of Philadelphia Yearly Meeting of Friends. I'd been volunteering with Friends Peace Committee for a couple of years, helping to build it into the premier Philly peace group for anti-war demonstrations. The group's director was way overdue for a sabbatical year and decided to take two years off to make up for it. He persuaded the board, his board, that I should take his place while he was gone. He set off for the Rocky Mountains and promised to return in the summer of 65. <laughs> Friends Peace Committee represented and sometimes mobilized Philadelphia Yearly Meeting, a constellation of 100 Quaker congregations in the Delaware Valley. It was the perfect spot for someone who wanted to do his part. With my wife's support and my Vietnam-bound classmates in the back of my mind, I cranked up the group's budget and grew its staff while also 
taking graduate courses at Penn. I felt productive with Friends Peace Committee. Still, I was never entirely easy with the life I was living. My days, I knew, weren't anything like those of my high school classmates in Vietnam. Fast forward to 1975. I'm at my high school class's 20th reunion, and I hear someone say, George, I got to talk with you. I've been avoiding it. Richard D'Eduardo stared at me while his body swayed unsteadily. We were in the crush around the bar, and he had obviously been there for a while. He took another swallow. It looked like whiskey on the rocks. I knew you'd want to, I said quietly. Richard had served in Vietnam. I hoped this confrontation wouldn't turn physical, not in the middle of an otherwise cheerful night, surrounded by our peers. Okay, so it was hell, and none of us wanted to be there. But we thought we had to serve our country, right? And I'm one of the lucky ones because I didn't get shot up. It was hell, George. Hell. Another swallow. I've got no words for what it was. While I was listening, I was suddenly moving my feet apart to give me a better balance. I was glad I'd had only one beer. The advantages of being brought up a teetotaler. And we're all there because we're trying to serve our country, right? It's our fucking country, George. It's our flag. And we're getting shot. And we're getting booby trapped. And we're losing our limbs and losing our minds, George, our fucking minds. I know I don't need to say anything. Richard is into it now. This thing he's avoided, this come between us. My high school class was small, maybe 115 students. We knew each other and had school spirit and class loyalty. Richard isn't weaving as much. Maybe the intensity of what he's saying is sobering him up. I know I'm plenty focused. I'm finally home on furlough and I'm trying to forget everything and pig out on my mom's pasta and get into the pants of every Italian girl who will let me. But I can't skip the 11 o'clock news, not unless I'm screwing. And even then I'm thinking about it. I think about the news. One night I'm watching it and they're showing another anti-war demonstration and I see people getting arrested and loaded into the paddy wagon and I see you. He paused and his stare got even more intense. I see George, my classmate, getting in the fucking paddy wagon, my classmate. And if I'd been there, he paused again, then lowered his voice. If I'd been there, I would have killed you. I no longer heard or saw the people at the bar. Our eyes held each other as though the two of us were so alone that no desert or beach or wilderness could provide as much solitude as now surrounded us. I was ready and curious and scared and also wondering what this loyalty challenge would demand later when I got the chance really to think about it. Our stare held and then Richard's eyes shifted. He looked at his drink, shook his head, put the glass on the bar. All right, he said, eyes suddenly tearing up. That was then. I've been home for a while, time to think. I can hardly do much else, but I do hold down a job. Now I figure I know what you were doing when you got arrested. He paused again, then continued. You were on our side. You wanted me home. I slowly exhaled and found my eyes were wet too. I had to ask, 
and the rightness of the war. Sure, I figured out it was bullshit. Didn't everybody? But that's not the main thing. Not between us. The main thing is that you weren't stabbing me in the back. Richard suddenly looked shy and very sober. So I got to shake your hand, okay? I grabbed his outstretched hand, ready to make an emotional response of my own, then saw that he was already looking away. He had done what he could do. I let go of his hand and half turned away, grateful, wanting to support his dignity. I clapped his shoulder lightly. You're a hell of a guy, Richard, I said. And this is a hell of a class. He smiled for the first time, reached for his glass and raised it in a wordless toast. It was July 4, 1976. The high temperature and humidity weren't the only reason we were hot. We could see police snipers on the roofs of the houses in North Philadelphia. Thousands of us were crowded into the narrow streets. The low-income Black neighborhood of row houses and dollar stores was the assembly point for our July 4 parade, because ours was the grassroots alternative to the elite-led celebration in Center City. Now we are masked, waiting for our civil rights lawyer to negotiate the snipers away. We were worried that when this parade started, provocateurs working undercover with the police might start an incident with the march, giving the snipers an excuse to start shooting. If that happened, all hell would break loose. Our attorney was explaining that the parade would refuse to march until the snipers were withdrawn from the roofs. Alan Tuttle and I were raising, were tossing jokes back and forth as usual, but without making much of a dent in our anxiety. Raised in a Quaker farming family in upstate New York, Alan was now exploring ways to put his education to work through organizing an action. If I had to move away from the crowd for an organizing task, it was easy to find Alan again. He was tall, broad-shouldered, broad and red-haired. His muscular body and the gait of someone who grew up doing farm chores projected a reassuring solidity in the midst of today's volatile crowd. The steady drone of police helicopters overhead didn't reduce the tension. If we didn't start the march soon, impatience in the crowd could mess us up. My work was done except for bringing a cool head to the hot day. I had been part of the activist bicentennial committee that planned the march. And in that role, I had taken my first stand as a gay man in the rough and tumble world of coalition politics. I had been nervous about that. I argued in the meeting that there's a new and necessary plank for the liberation platform and that the lesbians and bisexuals and gays who for years have worked invisibly in social movements deserve to be claimed by that coalition. The night before the key meeting, Alan and I rehearsed the points I would make. I found myself growing angry at the coalition members whose homophobia might mo block the, my motion. And I was angry at myself for being so scared about their reaction. The angrier I got, the more Alan encouraged me to vent. Soon I was pounding the mattress and yelling until it occurred to me that they might say, good idea, George, let's do it. At that point, I started to laugh and told Alan about this new thought. No, Alan protested. You activists aren't supposed to agree yet. Give George a harder time first. We both collapsed on the bed in hilarity. The next evening, 
I made my proposal at the meeting and the response was completely positive coming from a range of leaders. Look, George, those snipers are pulling back, Alan pointed. And we saw police giving way on roof after roof. The helicopters also backed off, still within sight, but no longer so menacing. The parade at last began to move and with it, the swell of a chant, the people united will never be defeated. Alan and I each threw an arm around the other's shoulder despite the heat and fell into line. As we moved through the streets with their close packed houses, people came out to join us. Colorful banners bobbed and weaved. Dark clouds had been rolling in for some time with no lessening of heat. The blobs of melting tar on the street didn't seem to matter so much when someone struck up an old civil rights song, we're on our way to freedom land. Our growing thousands were in our barely organized way calling for another Independence Day. Independence this time, not from the British Empire, but from the American Empire. Suddenly we crossed Ridge Avenue into Fairmount Park, surging into the greenery toward a large open area resonant with the sound of dozens of steel drums. Those in the front lines moved fully into dance. Just as most of us had crossed into the park, the storm broke. Screams of joy broke out as men pulled off t-shirts, youngsters tore across the fields in ragged lines, and dancers increased in numbers and passion. Alan and I danced and laughed and danced with the rest. Snipers forgotten, eyes locking with shouts of love. The blessed rain was cooling our skins and baptizing our community. A July 4 to remember. <laughs> One morning at breakfast, five-year-old Ingrid seemed intent on eating her cereal, then suddenly addressed me and Alan, who had slept over with me the previous night. Daddy, you and Alan are lovers, right? Yes, I replied. Then Ingrid continued, why don't we call you a mommy and daddy? I smiled at my wife, Barrett, and turned to Ingrid. Because you already have a mommy and daddy, sweetie, and that's Barrett and me. We're your very own special people. Alan likes to play with you and cares about you. So maybe you could call him uncle. I finished lamely. Alan grinned at my discomfort. You can call me uncle if you want, Ingrid, but I like it when you call me Alan. The main thing is that we're all friends and you get a lot of love. Ingrid grinned back at Alan and asked, can you fix my bike after breakfast? We all laughed. So that's the bottom line, Barrett observed dryly. A month later, Ingrid's best friend, Evie, was eating dinner at our house. After the silent grace, Ingrid spoke up with what seemed to be a continuation of an argument she was having with Evie. Daddy, isn't it true that men can make love with men and women can make love with women? Yes, that's true, I said. You see, Ingrid said to Evie, men don't even need women to make love. Evie hastened to cover her tracks. I already knew that, she said. Ingrid turned back to me with a puzzled expression. How do men make love? I started to answer while adults around the table, trying to look casual, dug into their food. I didn't go on very long because Ingrid's curiosity was soon satisfied and she launched into another topic. <laughs> so those are the selections that I uh, queued up thinking they might uh, <laughs> cover a range of uh, bits uh, that are in the memoir. And uh, we decided that you would enjoy seeing the trailer for the 
documentary film that's being made. There's a full length documentary film being made about my life and work. And um, a trailer has been created, an eight minute tra trailer that just gives you a, a, a hint of what the, the film might turn out like. When I was 19, I loved walking on that beach, especially when I needed alone time something that was very much on my mind the previous year and coming to a head was what's my life about yes i want to be a teacher that seems like a great way to make a living but what's my life really about and it really came to a head one night i walked for hours and hours uh, on that beach back and forth looking at the sea looking at me and asking god what am I really centrally to do? And the message became clear as crystal that my life was to be about social change. Think about the climate crisis. And there's a reason for standing right here because this bank is believe it or not financing the development of fossil fuels it's one thing to do something that you think might be a harm in 200 years but to do something that's harming us right now we don't even have to wait to find out from the scientists is this a problem they are creating the problem right now by financing the problem what didn't make my family unique my dad is gay. My mom is from Norway, so she's an immigrant. My parents adopted my brother and sister. They're African American. My parents are white. I was the big surprise that showed up. And we lived in a collective household. 11 people in one house, an intentionally feminist community. We're Quakers. There were just a lot of ways that almost every issue of America or American families got expressed in our family. Keep it in the ground! I've been on a grandparent's walk for climate justice. We're here at Independence Hall because so many uh, good things started here, as well as some things that are, are problematic. We're having to create a new country, really. I've made grievous errors in my life. I'm a mixed bag like anybody else, and like my country is. So I'd like to give my country the complicated view that I give myself at the same time as acknowledging that we we fall short. My dad was the one that was always out of gallivanting around the world <laughs> doing something. But it was like, I always knew that he was, I felt like he was fighting for right, right, whatever right is. You're not wanting them to see you as, oh, we're activists, we've seen activists. You're wanting to convey, we're grandparents. Oh, this is about yeah. image convey. And the rocking chairs really support you. George knows what he's doing. <laughs> he knows how to work with rebels. And I was a rebel, and I was ready to burn it to the ground. It's not enough to just be right or wrong, or to be angry or not. You have to actually convince other people to join you in resisting. And it was the first time in my entire life that any teacher or educator had ever taught me how to be a better rebel. My dad is such a good Quaker. He's such a good Quaker. What does it mean to be a good Quaker, right? It's a really about the like, what is my purpose? What am I here to do? And how do I do that with integrity? And how do I do it leaning on spirit? So it's not about an ego trip. It's not about like, how do I get on the front page? It's really about like, what is spirit calling on me to do? Phoenix, a self-ordained mercy ship manned by a crew of determined American pacifists. Its mission, to bring medical supplies to the North Vietnamese port of Haiphong, despite Red Cross warnings and without State Department clearance. The sailboat is also a romantic thing, and the fact there was eight people, eight people against the might of the American Empire. It was, it was, there was something very, very uh, Robin Hood about it, I think. I found myself led by spirit to offer myself for the next voyage. It would sail from Hong Kong to South Vietnam. 
This leading to join the voyage was very strong. It felt like God was tapping me on the shoulder. This is George Lakey reporting on this campaign. After Harry went into the water and was picked up by 610, the main Navy vessel 610, I jumped into the water and swam over. The clarity of the summons didn't stop me from thinking about consequences, of course. There are at least four guys in the water after George. Oh, boy. They've got him surrounded now. I'm human. I want to live a long life and certainly not die in my 20s in an ocean halfway around the world. I thought about young people slain in the civil rights war and the struggle against apartheid in South Africa and so many other movements where activists surely wanted to die as little as I did. And for that matter, my dad's brother in the Navy during World War II and others in the armed forces of the world who couldn't make it back alive. I think I'm no one special in that life and death way. All of us have a responsibility to believe in something larger than ourselves, something so important that we're willing to die for it if that's what it takes. Here I am, 83. He's lived this incredibly courageous, big life that his parents could never have imagined for him. And I think in some ways the largest impact has been on the number of people he's trained. He's trained thousands of people from around the world who have in turn trained others and led movements and campaigns and been teachers and all of this thing. So it's like that's a very big boulder in a lake to make a huge all the ripples that we can't even see. The value of the ripple effect of training when you're doing well is that folks stick around in the movement and continue to provide offerings. And they don't look like George Lakey. They don't do trainings like George Lakey. But they certainly would describe themselves as influenced by. And that's what you really want. You want you don't want mimicry. You want new ways, new styles, folks that, that have their own lingo and rhythm and rhyme. The wild card here is the behavior of the police, because if police jump on you over and over and over, there's a point where anybody can crack. Sir, sir, you need to respect we are soldiers in the army. We gotta fight, although we gotta cry. We gotta hold up the freedom banner. We gotta hold it up until we die. It's a great song, isn't it? True marching song. And that's it. <laughs> Greg, take it away. <laughs> um, George, you like some? Can we do a little Q and A? Oh my God. Did we lose George? I'm, I seem to be muted. Sorry, by the way, for the uh, technical difficulty around the sound. The trailer ordinarily sounds much, much, <laughs> much clearer than that. <laughs> Hi, Yoko. Am I, am I? Yes. Can you hear me? Yes, I think so. Oh. Yes. Yes. George, can you hear me? I hear you. Thank you. Uh, <clears throat> now I can't hear you. 
Mr. Nicole. Yeah, uh, George, I'm sorry, Greg, I think we can hear you, but there was a little bit of, it sounded like your microphone maybe was rubbing against clothing, but now you want to try again? Yeah, for some reason, um, I'm not sure why, but it sounded like Greg wanted to do a Q and A. Is that right, Greg? You want to give me a thumbs up if that's yes. <laughs> um, does anybody have any questions for George? Or George, I don't know if you want to make any comments about the video. Apologies for any tech issues here. <laughs> no, I'm curious about uh, any questions that folks might have or reflections. Comments that are okay too. So feel free to unmute if you'd like to ask a question or you can type it into the chat. And I did just want to mention, I'm going to pop in the um, uh, chat a link to where you can purchase the book, uh, which isn't yet published, but it will, uh, you can reserve an advanced copy. And the website says it will be available on November 15th. So I'm going to go ahead and share that right now. But feel free if anyone wants to chime in with any questions. Okay. Okay. So when does your documentary come out, George? <laughs> we don't know because um, it's the funding is still being secured. So okay. we've we over hundred thousand dollars has come in from individuals and seventy five thousand dollars from a Quaker fund, um, but it costs three hundred twenty five thousand dollars to make a full length documentary. So um, the the filmmakers busy fundraising to be able to complete it. Excellent. So just to let you know, Susan Chats just chimed in. She said, such a great storyteller, George. I'll pre-order the book. Yay. <laughs> and Susan Chats said she doesn't have a mic or camera today. So she wanted to apologize there. <laughs> Nicole? Yes, Yoko, we can hear you. Good. Uh, great wrote to you personally, but uh, can you read it for him? Oh, it went to me in chat. Okay, let me see if I can find that. Um, hold on a second. Um, it went through chat or over email maybe? Huh. Chat. Chat. Oh, okay, I don't see a message in chat for me. Why don't you read it? Oh. Okay, now we can hear you perfect. Uh, so maybe. Oh, you hear me? Yes. George, you once told me about your work sensitizing the AFSC to gay issues. Can you tell us more about that? Uh, well, one of the stories in the book is about the, the uh, very tough decision that Barrett and I made um, to come out when we were invited to be plenary speakers at French General Conference because we knew there'd be a thousand people in a field house from around the country. And um, we were invited to speak on the topic of community. And we were, um, we were feeling out of integrity in relationship to the Society of Friends. Because while our friends knew that we were polyamorous, that we had an open marriage and uh, a very uh, strong one, um, but our friends knew that and uh, the, Society of Friends did not. And so the Society of Friends in general was creating a kind of picture postcard of us that was incredibly sweet. You know, this young couple, white couple that adopted black children and the children are so cute. And, you know, every, it was just all very sweet. And we thought, um, whoa. Uh, and, and I was being invited all over the place to speak. And I, 
we thought this, this wouldn't happen in the early 70s, which was a highly homophobic period, of course, in American life. And uh, people would be very upset. So we're really hiding something that's, that's um, it's just wrong. It's just wrong to be hiding that. And so we ought to come out. On the other hand, can we, can we even stand it? <laughs> because it was only four years after um, Stonewall, you know, and, and so it was still, gayness was still considered by most people to be something that goes on in New York among, you know, the, the kind of marg very, very marginal people. And uh, certainly nothing that anybody we know would be, would be gay. And so, uh, so it took enormous lot of, of counseling and prayer uh, to come to the resolution that we would not, uh, that, that, we, that we would be straight up. We would be, um, <laughs> we would rejoin integrity and, and tell the truth and see what happened. And so I tell that book, that story in the book and what happened. I tell what happened in that book, including um, the immediate response in Ithaca in the field house of a thousand and the next day meeting friends at breakfast. <laughs> you can imagine taking our kids to breakfast. We, we walk into that room and uh, oh, I'm so tempted to read it too, but I won't because, um, but anyway, you can, you can imagine going into the cafeteria and everybody going quiet when the Lakeys walk in, right? And then, and then we're, we're sitting down with our kids and noticing everybody's quiet. And then the people notice they're they're quiet, so they start, you know, uh, hitting their coffee cups with spoons and stuff to <laughs> like revive. Hey, we, we, you know, life life goes on, life goes on, and uh, and 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 there's and more. There's more to tell. So. Uh, anyway, that's that's in the book. <laughs> Obviously, I mean, many doors did close. Many doors did close. And uh, one, one wise peace person uh, said, George, we were hoping that you would be the successor to A.J. Musty as kind of uh, what Time Magazine called Mr. Pacifist. And uh, you, you destroyed that. You destroyed that chance. And lots of doors closed. Uh, and nevertheless, um, we were so, we felt so uh, freed by uh, no longer uh, masquerading. Thank you. Um, George, I just wanted to reflect on my own observation and feeling. Um, my father was a lifer in the military and my mom's brother was a nom and, and uh, stepped on a landmine. He survived, but he is a disabled Vietnam vet. And one thing that has always been uncomfortable for me um, is coming to Quaker religion, knowing about um, the history of um, peace and pushing for peace, which is what really draws me to it. And the parallel I see between me and you is your uncle passed away, you know, he perished during the war and just how that must have affected your feelings around war and participation. I'm just curious if if that rings any bells for you because it, it really just struck me listening, listening to that aspect and seeing that connection in myself, I guess. <laughs> oh yeah, taking that stand in my family system my, you know, my birth family system was very tough. Uh, my father had a lot of trouble with that. And um, especially because he'd been in the military, he'd been drafted in the military with three children. He left three children at home, drafted in the military in World War II, uh, which was very, very hard on him. He was, never, he was not the same person when he came back. And um, so when people had gone, and his brother, his very own brother, his only brother was killed in the Pacific. Uh, during World War II. And so um, when people go through so, such hardship in order to do the right thing, you know, for their country and sacrificing so much for their country and then see somebody else apparently not sacrificing for their country, you know, taking a free ride, uh, it's extremely difficult. And, uh, and yeah, so we had, a, we, had, we had trouble with that. And he came to the view by uh, about, he came to the view by the late 60s 
that the Vietnam War was wrong and that I had done the right thing. Uh, but it was, uh, that was a big journey. And I had so much respect for him that he could get there. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah, it's very interesting to see the parallels. And I haven't quite gotten broached the subject with my parents, but um, I, I do feel a level of discomfort and concern and not wanting to, you know, disrespect the family dynamic, I guess. <laughs> Yeah, family. We only have one family, right? Most of us, yeah. Which is just one reason why I, you know, community is so important in, in society. Friends' ability to generate community is so important because we take un stands that are sometimes very unpopular with the families of origin of people who are attracted to us. All right, any more questions from anyone? Oh, it looks like Tom Bernie, your hand is up. Do you wanna turn off your mic? Do you know how to do that? Turn it up? Oh, no, can you you're hear me? we hear you, yep, you can go ahead. <laughs> Hello, everyone, it's wonderful. I'm very, very bad at this because of my stroke. So if for some reason you need to, close me out of this because I'm not pushing the right buttons, <laughs> I would not be offended. Um, it's kind of a, a, a simple point, I think. Um, I'm pretty sure that uh, William Penn said, carry your sword as long as you are able. And if it becomes too heavy, lay it down and the other part of that is i mean i laid down my sword am i the only military veteran at cpmn hmm. oh i don't know Go ahead, Greg. Did you have your hand up? Were you? Just to say, I'm a veteran. Uh, you heard? Yeah. Yep, we can hear you. <laughs> <laughs> well, if I may be heard, I, I I will put my computer away from my pants, but she's a good problem, and say thanks to George for providing us all a real role model uh, much appreciated yeah thank you tom and greg that was really great to hear from both of you um esther it looks like you have a question you can, you can unmute well first of all i i would I would like to re respond to Tom, um, even if it's just to say, I don't know, but <clears throat> we did have an issue with one time with uh, a daughter of one of our members wanting to be an airline pilot and she had to have uh, some kind of experience which you could only get to the military. And, and so the meeting had quite a bit of problem with that and finally decided it was okay for her to join the Coast Guard for a while. <clears throat> and uh, I, I don't know what else I have to say to say to George, except that I can hardly wait to read the book and I'm sorry it's not available yet. <laughs> that was my daughter you were talking about. Yes. She's still flying for Delta. Uh, George, just to chime in again, Susan Chass said, thank you, George, you are still teaching. I feel the same way. <laughs> Yeah, 
Yeah, I could just uh, let you in on a, an author's, a writer's secret here. Um, I was, uh, I was overwhelmed by the task of writing a memoir because I've lived too long. I waited too long. I should have written it when I was fifty, and and uh, it was like way, way, way too much stuff. <laughs> Too many adventures, too many you know incidents, too many anecdotes, and um, and I uh, what I submitted first to the publisher, the the publisher, the guy who owns the 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 thing, called me and said, George, your last name is not Obama. We can't publish a book that thick. <laughs> One hundred fifteen thousand words is it. Period. Boom. We're done. So you got to you got to cut it, man. So um, I cut and cut and cut. And a major criterion, I realized uh, like halfway through the cutting uh, that I was using. I wasn't using it consciously, but I was using it. And that was which are the stories that might teach somebody something useful. And so a lot of the stories that I cut out, I thought, well, that's not going to teach anybody anything. Uh, and so it, uh, you know interesting stories yes yes but um or dramatic or whatever but what what can people learn from so that uh that teacher persona that lives so strongly in me that identity identity um was came to my rescue <laughs> when it came to uh deciding which things to keep in the um in the book and which things to throw out <laughs> Um, so George, I'm an archivist, so I, I, I think of these papers that you've written, and I really hope you're going to give them to someone like Swarthmore or Haverford College, because I'd hate to see that 1,000, however many words to, to disappear into the ether. So <laughs> I'd be happy to share resources if you did want information on sharing your personal papers, because that's important. <laughs> They will definitely go there. <laughs> Excellent. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, Susan said again, perfect. Always the question in our lives. What will be of use? All of the above is my feeling as an archivist and librarian. <laughs> <laughs> uh. All right, well, we're closing on, in on noon, which is when we're going to wrap things up. So um, big round of applause or jazz hands for George, who did a wonderful job today. We really appreciate having you. Um, so this, once again, was put forth by the um, Central Philadelphia Monthly Meeting Library Committee. And our next meeting will be in September, where we'll be talking about future author talks. So if anybody has recommendations or suggestions, um, please let me know. Um, you can hopefully see my latest email to the CPMM listserv um, or feel free to text me. My number's on the screen. Um, and yes, the library will be uh, purchasing a copy of George's book once it's made available. So look out for that. And uh, thank you so much. Anything else from George? There we go. There's the cover. <laughs> Great cover. <laughs> There's the cover. <laughs> Something I, I love about their choice of this cover is that it shows uh, who's happy and who's not so comfortable in that, that situation. <laughs> yeah, it's lots of emotion, which is why it's such a great cover, along with the title. <laughs> You're dancing in I there. I think it won't be used as a recruiting poster for, for police, <laughs> uh, but, but anyway, <laughs> it's fun for me. <laughs> All right, I'm going to end the recording, but thanks again, George, and uh, everyone have a Thank lovely you. rest of your day. Take Thank care. You. Okay, bye-bye. <laughs>